Thanks to everyone. I'm Andrew Stuck. I'm one of the co-producers of Walk, Listen, Create. We're a not-for-profit uh, registered in Belgium. We try to support um, walking writers, w uh, walking performers, walking artists. Um, and uh, Gail Simmons is uh, very graciously accepted our invitation to be our Walking Writers Salon guest today. Um, how the Walking Writers Salons have sort of emerged is basically we've been running some writing competitions. There's one going on at the moment. Um, and our poet in residence, Tony Horitz, is uh, in the room. So uh, he was the uh, uh, winner from last year in the poetry category. And um, there are opportunities for people to uh, take part in that if they so wish. So uh, just follow the links on the website, as they say. Uh, what we try to do with Walking Writers Salons is actually to find out more about uh, how the writer writes and walks as opposed to the content of her book uh, or their books. Uh, but we will obviously talk a little bit about um, Gail's book, which is called Between the Chalk and the Sea. So, and I know there are some people in the room who've actually read the book, so that's fantastic too. And it'll help you when you come to uh, tackle a multiple choice quiz. Um, so first off, let me introduce Gail. Now she asked me that, she said that what she'd written in the biography um, on the Walk, Listen, Create uh, website was a bit dry. So uh, I'm just going to say Gail Simmons is, uh, she describes herself as a walking writer and the author of The Country of Larks, um, which was a journey in the Chilterns. It was shortlisted for the Edward Stanford Travel Writing Awards in 2020. Uh, she has an ME, MA in medieval history and what I think we might explore a little bit, a PhD in creative writing. She teaches at Bath Spa uh, University uh, on the nature and travel writing uh, modules and the MA. Um, Gail, of course, is a travel journalist as well, so she's contributed to all the main broadsheets and uh, also magazines. And she's also appeared on Woman's Hour and uh, the BBC's From Our Own Correspondent. So, Gail, uh, welcome to the uh, Walking Writers Salon. Thank and, you so much. Um, uh, thank you for writing such a brilliant book, which is part memoir, part sort of topographical documentary i suppose and yeah. part part history um yeah. but yeah. one of the things that comes through it so strongly is how you've been influenced by the chalk landscape in your lifetime but one yeah. of the one of the things you say which i think is the first thing i really want to get on to uh, and get on to quickly is that you say that landscape influences your writing and influences others others writing too and that the softer plasticity of this chalk landscape is very different from where you live now in the Pennine. So would you like to give us a little bit more on, on writing and, and how the landscape influences your writing? Well, I'm very happy to talk about that. It's something that I wasn't aware of until fairly recently when I wrote this book, that, I'm, that I seem to be drawn to, to chalk landscapes. I've lived on or near chalk most of my life. So um, when when my family settled in the Chilterns after my dad was um, traveling, taking us around the world in, when he was in the army, um, it was a chalk landscape. And so I grew up for the first 10 years of my sort of second half of my childhood, uh, surrounded by these chalk fields where you'd go out in winter and everything would sort of seem to gleam white. You'd find these amazing flints lying in the ground. Even, even in, in dull weather, the landscape seemed to sort of shine because of the whiteness. And so, of course, part of it is because it's the landscape where I used to explore with my little brother. We'd go into the, the, the hedgerows when they were still quite thick and not too trimmed as they are nowadays and make dens and just sort of wander around and run around and go a little bit wild. Again, not something you can easily do these days. Um, so I think partly it's that. And then I lived in Oxford for a while and I used to go over to the to the North Wessex Downs. Marlborough Downs, maybe you'd call them, up into White Horse, and see all those wonderful sort of etch there's a, etchings in in this in the chalk, um, the historic monuments like Wayland Smithy and all those long barrows, and and then and then lived and now live up in Yorkshire, not quite in the Dales, sort of kind of on the edge, 
the Pennine landscape, and um, but the, the East East Yorkshire has the Wolds, which is another chalk landscape. So I sometimes try and escape over there. But it is a very different landscape to where I'm living. Here we have what's known as a millstone grit under your feet. Now the clue is in the word millstone grit. It's so hard it was you made millstones from it in order to grind your wheat kernels. So it's a very hard and unforgiving stone. It's an amazingly, you know, stunning, dramatic landscape, but it doesn't have the sort of softness of chalk, which I think is my my rock. And it means that I find that I can't really write about where I live. It's almost too, it's almost like, you know, there's, there's, there's too, it's too hard to be etched into. Now, chalk is a very soft rock. People have drawn on it, as I've said. You know, the Long Man of Wilmington appears in my book. I've mentioned the Uffington White Horse. There's chalk figures all over the landscape. People have buried their ancestors and their relatives in chalk. And it's also a landscape that's attracted writers and painters, people like Revillius, Nash, you know, the Bloomsbury set were all based in that chalk landscape. So for me, it seems a natural canvas to write about or to write on, if you like. I think you're mute. Muted. Um, uh, something we just chatted about before. We, uh, you jokingly said you couldn't you couldn't write Wuthering Heights um, uh, if you were uh, living in the chalk landscape. No, no. Bronte, uh, Emily Bronte, was it Emily? Couldn't have written Wuthering Wuthering Downs. You know, it's just not the same. It's, and I think that's correct. I think I think here the landscape is dramatic and it's kind of blustery and it can be quite bleak and it also be really beautiful as well. But um, you, it, it's the character is much harder, much harsher, much more dramatic, and it kind of doesn't really suit my writing, which I think is quite quite gentle, I guess. Um, that's for other people to say. But uh, so my pet theory is that, you know, chalk, chalk is a natural landscape to, to write on because it's so it's so pliable. OK, so so next up, tell us a bit more about how you write and how you walk, because in the in the book, you actually talk about rhythm and how important rhythm is to both you stepping out across the downs and 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 also getting pen to paper. Yes, um, although I didn't actually put much pen to paper when I was walking, because if you've ever tried writing and walking, you realise you can't actually do it because you wouldn't get anywhere. One, you'd have to keep stopping um, and, you know, your, your notebook would blow away or whatever. But the second and most important thing is that I think you can only really get a kind of rhythm going when you when you don't stop, when you walk and, you you know, it's a, like almost a heartbeat of the footsteps. And that's where the words come for me. So so the way I walk and write is 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 to is to take a little well sort of Olympus dictaphone thing and I speak to it and the words just come it's as if I'm talking to somebody else. So uh I for me I can almost not I can hardly write if I'm sitting still. It has to be it for me it's very connected with movement and particularly movement foot. Well well I, I'm, I, that that's intriguing too because in the book you talk about um an imaginary medieval companion so is that the person you're talking to in your dictaphone and and yes. and is it and, and is it you know a deliberate is it something you do deliberately every time you go and write about anything i mean you know so if you're a travel journalist and you're trying to um encourage people to go and visit certain places or see different places do you, do you find it easier if you have an imaginary person or imaginary listener or an imaginary reader what's i think i think you always need to think about who you're writing for um but i've never taken an imaginary companion with me as i did on this walk i didn't really take her as a kind of writing aid i took her because i was doing this walk on my own and it was quite a sort of lonely thing to do because it sort of all happened in COVID and, you know, between lockdowns and there weren't many people about, you know, it was a time when certainly the beginning part of it, a lot of accommodation was known. and people weren't really out, you know, people were still very much locked in at home and not really traveling. Um, and then I thought to myself, well, you know, I'm on my own. Why don't I go with somebody and not only any old person, but a medieval woman, because if I can go with her, then maybe I can see it through her eyes. I can imagine what she would see when she was walking here. And that that really helped me get into the history of it, actually. 
imagining her, you know, when I was sort of walking with my sort of walking boots, and I thought, well, what about her and her skirts and her sort of leather slippers? How would she cope? You know, and it made me really kind of um, identify with what people put themselves through in order to undertake these journeys on foot in the Middle Ages. But it it was helpful as a writer because I felt I was telling her stuff. You yes. know, I almost, felt, I almost feel her there with me. Although you actually talk about her and say that she rides a horse most of the time, so perhaps she's. Well, I don't know, but I guess that she 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 was a. I, I, she, she's semi-fictional. Her husband definitely existed because they dug up his house in Southampton, Cuckoo Lane, um, and they found two ampules, lead ampules that were um, that used to be filled with Thomas Beckett's blood, and they were proof that two people in that house went to Canterbury and got these souvenirs and brought them home to Southampton, which is one of the rationales for the route. Now, Richard Southwick was, was a wealthy merchant, lived around the turn of the 13th century. Um, his house was demolished in about 1348 because they had to fortify the town against the French, who kept raiding. So they had to tear down his house, which is a great merchant's house, like the ones in Venice almost, by the sea, and then build up these big ramparts, which still exist in Southampton. And um, anyway, so they, they dug up the foundations of family's ampules. So I thought, well, he must have a he must have had a wife because everybody did in those days. And so why don't I call her Alice? Because that was a popular name in the Middle Ages. And so then she sort of started appearing in front of me. And she probably would have had taken a horse because she was probably quite wealthy. So so she kind of rode beside me, like the wife of Bath. OK, so next up is why the route you chose. I mean, you know, how did it come about? I, I've actually put a link into the Goff map, but I, I'm kind of interested in knowing what inspired you to to choose the route you did and, 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 and also what, you know, what came first in, in terms of once you started doing research, you discovered lots of things about this route. So, yeah, do you want to? Well, like a lot of like a lot of. Um, projects it sort of came out about by accident so I'd always wanted to walk on the South Downs it was the one chalk landscape I hadn't walked on it was always the wrong side of London from where I was so that was kind of percolating in the back of my head and then after I wrote my first book I got invited to do a piece for I can't remember which paper it was but it was about I think it was Telegraph Weekend or something like that on walks with meaning so for 20 walks with meaning right so whether they're following in someone's footsteps a literary figure or a pilgrimage or whatever it was. And as a result of that, I found out about the old way, which is this pilgrimage route that I walk and went to interview um, Will Parsons, who was a founding member of the British Pilgrimage Trust and who found with his with his um, partners, but mostly him, this rediscovered this pilgrimage route that was marked on a map called the Goff map, which is in the Bodleian Library and produced around 1290 and then redone they think repurposed in about 1340 something like that they can't tell exactly and I just and as soon as I heard about this I thought yeah you know what's not to like it's, it's a short landscape it's you know it's a long walk it's the, it's the downs it's medieval history it's also you know quite a bit of politics involved because that part of England is sort of you know fortress Britain and all that kind of world war ii sort of stuff about like cliffs of Dover and all that sort of thing you know so, so there was a lot of there was a lot of stuff going on, and I thought, yeah, that's it. And I found when thinking of book ideas, and I'm having the same sort of process now with thinking about a new idea, is that you cannot you cannot force these ideas to come. You cannot say, well, what shall I write about next? It's a light bulb that goes off, and it sparks, and then then you think, ah, oh, there's something there, and then you have to sort of think it through and think it through again. So the more I thought about it, the more I thought, yes, this is this is this is a book I want to write. It's got enough. It's got enough length and it's got enough depth. There's enough texture to it because it's got, you know, multiple themes. Um, yeah, no, yeah, it's, got so, lot, it's, it's got lots of layers because obviously it's got your, it's a kind of personal memoir. But obviously the medieval history comes through a lot because, uh, yeah. but, but also history of Neolithic and Saxon times. Exactly. Uh, but because uh, but the, I, I, I'm kind of interested, you, you obviously, as it was a pilgrimage, you, you visited a lot of churches. And many of those actually come from the medieval period, don't they? Um, did you did you find did, did you find that your own um, spiritual you know centre was was strengthened through the walk? I mean, what what, what do you 
did you well, find the Sidinus or Celtic yeah. fringe, you know, thin places? Uh, did you get closer I, to God? <laughs> all of the above, really. Um, I, you kind of, it, it's difficult to pinpoint exactly what's going on, whether it's the length of the walk, time spent alone, time spent in nature, very important, connecting with the landscape. Um, time spent in little churches in the middle of marsh marshlands that they're very hard to visit and you turn up there and it's just a few and a few sheep and you know you just feel you feel something and it's difficult to know exactly what it is you're feeling um you know so i felt this sort of kind of moments if you like in 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 these remote churches sometimes in the big cathedrals as well but probably less so but also just in in woodlands and to deep chalk coombs you'd feel that sort of sense of something bigger than yourself but it's hard to know it's hard to kind of label what is what's going on you know it's hard to put a sort of well that's that's sort of i'm being religious or i'm being celtic or i'm being christian i, I don't i kind of don't like to box it all up like that so but there's certainly something that happens when you're walking on your own for quite a long time in in a nice in a, in a, in a, in a, a landscape you love you, you also had the taste of the druids at one point i did I infiltrated a druid, a druid sect. Um, they're not that secretive, but they, they, they're, well, they're slightly secretive because they, they're a little bit sort of, um, protective of what they do, but they celebrate the, the turn of the Celtic seasons. So I found out that they were this druid sect every year. They, well, they celebrate all the Celtic seasons, but this was in bulk, which is the, 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 the feast, which became candle mass in, in Christian no religion the christian religion but was really the sort of turn between uh, or, uh winter late winter and early spring so right at the uh, right at the beginning of february they hold a they they held a sort of druid ceremony in, in sight of the long man of wilmington in 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 sussex and i kind of joined in and was part of that whole sort of ceremony and it was quite moving it must be said so yes it was it was an, an interesting an interesting event and yeah I'm glad I went. So, uh, so how much of the uh, you mentioned the dictaphone and things about that, but how much how much of the whole process of putting this book together, which probably took you what three or four years to do? I mean, is that is that a sort of kind of what what you anticipated, or did you think you were going to get it done faster? Or it was supposed to take it was supposed to it should have taken three years. But because of because of the various lockdowns and I had to keep delaying certain walks, it was put back a year. But actually, I think that made for a better book because I think it would have been quite rushed to, to write it in the original time scale. So although all the lockdowns, etc., were a bit frustrating at times because I had to. I think it benefited me in the long run, and I think it also benefited because it made me understand more about what medieval pilgrims pilgrims would have had to go through. So we had COVID. Our, we, our movements was restricted, you know, we didn't know what was going on. We realized that although we thought we were bigger than nature, we're not, you know, we're very susceptible. And I thought, well, actually, this is exactly like the Black Death in the in the 14th century, where half up to half the population of Europe died. You know, it was a plague from the East. Black Death was brought along the Silk Road, they think. COVID came from the East. So actually, it was quite good for putting me in the mindset of a, of a medieval pilgrim. But from a writing point of view, it meant I had an extra year to write the book. And and I would say that. Again, you know, if you want to write a, the book, well, certainly for me, I'm not a fast writer, particularly, you know, don't don't rush it. Don't rush it. You know, see, so you give yourself the time to do it. Well, I mean, that's something is the the, the book itself is divided up into these um, Druid or Celtic seasons, <laughs> but, but yeah. then also you you actually what i'm kind of interested in is the you you basically made four sorties which were a sort of week long periods when you went walking um one in each season is that right and yes, and yes. How, how much was that pre-planned and how you, do you know what i mean and how much was you know when when, when did you suddenly go ah oh, hang on a moment this is going to be you know, uh, uh, an easier or, or 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 better task way to uh, to approach the task, the challenge, really. You know, it's a bit of both again. I, I originally I was going to do the whole walk in one month in spring because that's when you know in April when 
you also said, you know, pilgrims, pilgrims want to, to go out on pilgrimage. It's sap is rising and you want to go in spring. Um, but my walk was curtailed in the first week by COVID. So when I rethought this, I thought, well, actually, wouldn't it be better to write to do it over a year? Because actually, because it would make for a more interesting book because I could write about the landscape over four seasons instead of one. You know, and because I could write about it in spring, in, in summer, autumn and winter. So I thought, well, th this will be a more again, a more richly textured book if I do it this way. It'll also me, mean the journey is sort of more meaningful, because if it takes a year rather than a month, it kind of fits in with a sort of medieval idea of a year and a day. You know, when you went on pilgrimage as a, as a medieval citizen, you had to, they thought you might not come back. You had to make your will, you had to get your affairs in order, you had to, you know, make peace with your neighbours, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And then you went off for, for, for off to wherever you went and then if you weren't back within a year and a day which is a very medieval concept they assumed you were dead so the year thing suddenly rang true for me so I thought well okay so I'm going to walk it over seasons but because of the various lockdowns I realized that the seasons that I would be walking wouldn't be the height of the seasons it would be those kind of quarter season turns so not the equinoxes and the whatever the opposite of the equinoxes is solstices whatever if you walk between those, you're kind of on the cusp of seasons. So, for example, you know, in bulk was the cusp of the cusp of winter and spring. It wasn't the height of spring. And I love those cuspy seasons. I love that kind of. I hate to use the word liminal because it's overused, but, you know, sort of that kind of cuspiness of it all <laughs> kind of suits my my slightly sort of, um, you know, my character, I guess, which is which is uh, I'm a Pisces, which is police. <laughs> you know okay well now uh, you and i've been chatting away for about 15 20 minutes so what we say is it's time for the the audience to have a go uh, we, we have at least got one question in the in the chat but can i encourage people to um scribble something in the chat and then uh we can find you out and and, and get uh, this, uh, the discussion going further uh, but simon if you're there uh, would you like to uh, um, uh, say what you wrote? Or no, you're mid-mouthful, you don't. So I'm going to say it. Uh, Simon's nodding away. So um, he's just said he's just read something linking dopamine to movement. And isn't it easier to write when you feel good? So yes, uh, uh, do you agree yeah. with that? Oh, yes, um, absolutely. And I think, I think you know, when it always strikes me when when you know when we're, we're people are on strike and the unions are, or, or government are saying we need to get round the table and sort this out. No, you don't need to get round the table. That's the wrong thing to do. Go out for a walk. You'd never sort something sitting around a table in a kind of confrontational way. You go out for a walk and walk side by side with someone. That's how you sort out the world's problems. You know. So um, I don't know about the dopamine, but I'm sure it's true because we always feel good after exercise or any kind of movement, don't we? As I know I get very depressed if I have to sit still for too long. I think depression and st being static is are linked. So I imagine then that dopamine and movement are all. So, so when you came to uh, to writing the book yourself, did you find that you you you, you know what, what what's your sitting at the desk routine for for writing? Do you do you sort of try to write for a couple of hours or or until lunchtime or or, or what? Or do of, you find that every yeah, yeah, twenty yeah. minutes you're up for a, out for a walk? Well, <laughs> yes, um, probably. I probably set myself a target of I will write for at least two hours or three hours or whatever it is. And I won't stop. I think it's, setting yourself a word target is slightly harder because you're always word counting. Then you think you'll have a, quite done it now. I've done 490 words, another 10. You know, it's slightly distracting. Whereas by saying I'm going to sit down and do this for two hours or maybe three hours um, and then stop because, you know, you can overdo it, you can overdo the sitting. Um, but sometimes if you're in a real role, of course, you're not going to stop. So if after two or three hours, you, you, you really feel you're in the rhythm, then then you would go on. I would go on. But um, I would set myself a sort of time target because otherwise you're just not going to get it done, you know. <laughs> OK, just well, now we've got a couple of, couple of more people in there asking questions. So uh, Ruth, Broad, Brent, Ruth, are you there? Oh, yeah. Hi. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, hi. Thanks, Gail. Um, yeah, I had a question. You mentioned, I think it was the word etching that you used. Um, yeah. and about It's quite a kind of visual description and very tactile. And I just wondered if you do make any marks into the chalk, like writing, drawing, or whether it's just your, your footprints left behind or... No, I didn't really. Um, perhaps I should have done, but I did sort of grab, uh, take with me bits of chalk. I've got a piece here. So I, I, I should have, I probably shouldn't have taken from the landscape rather than giving back to it. But can you see that? The lump of chalk that I picked up on my, my walk. And I, that was, I think, the one that, when I went off the downs, I think I, I took that with me as a last piece of chalk I'd be with. But yes, it's, you know, it it, it is. It is just about scratchable with a normal knife, unlike a lot of stone, which is why, you know, partly why people have drawn into it or incised into it over over millennia. I mean, the Uffington White Horse is about 5000 years old. The people have been doing it an awful long time. And what I like is I slightly talk about this in the book is that it's still a living thing. So so for these chalk figures, whether it's Uffington White Horse, or the wrong man, they have these. um re-chalking kind of festivals where they go up to the monument, certainly Uffington White Horse, and they all they kind of re-chalk re the marks, otherwise the, the grass takes over. So for me, it's a kind of living thing as well. You know, these mon these these etchings are thousands of years or hundreds of years old, but yet they're they're still loved and they're still cared for. So they're still living, if you like. The so chalk is a kind of quite a sort of a living stone to me, if that makes sense. But no, I didn't actually do any marking into it. I felt I might have People might be watching him. Okay, so uh, Amelia asked a question, but she says that uh, she's got a background noise issue with the children. So uh, I don't really want me to read it out or whether you can read it, Gail, but after the walking and the recording, did much more change during your transcribing and editing process? And did the book's editors make many structural changes or suggestions? Hi, Amelia. Amelia's one of my students. <laughs> um, Yes, I changed an awful lot. You know, if you had seen the transcription of my notes, it, it just kind of, it was awful. It was just, even though I kind of tried to write in, in fully formed sentences, it, it, it was just, it was not publishable. And it took a lot of reworking to, to, to turn it into something that I was happy with. Um, so yes, the editing process is one of sort of, you know, it's honing and transformation. And the editors, yeah. So the, what happened was that the, as I worked on the book, I would send chunks off to the to the main editor, and she would make sort of suggestions like, you need a bit more memoir here, or you need to do this, or you need to, you know, don't lose the sight of the theme of the golf map or whatever it was. Something only someone, you know, with an overview, an outside view can see. So I had that as the book was progressing, and then after that, after submitting the manuscript, you have a line, a uh, sort of copy editor. Who goes through it line by line and sort of does minor changes and you argue about things like how many commas there should be and all this stuff. so yeah it's it's a book writing a book is a very it's solitary but it's also very communal you know you're writing it with other people you're writing it with your editors and your agent as well if you've got a very active agent oh, i can see a cat coming in the cat andrew just went past your window um yeah no, if you've got an agent yeah it's a gray one <laughs> Uh, an agent will also, if they're very involved, you know, she wanted to sort of see what was going on as well. So she was very active in the process, you know, because I had to do a proposal before the book actually was, got, got commissioned. And she I did a lot of editing before we even sent out with her suggestions. Um, so she acted as a sort of editor as well. So it is a very communal process. It's, you know, you think it's a solitary thing and it is to a certain extent. But once you're sort of getting it out there, it's quite communal. A lot of people involved. Um, great. OK, Rosie, uh, Rosie, if you want to ask your question, you, you uh, don't worry about the video if you want to just do the audio. Um, can you hear me OK? We can. Right. OK. Um, uh, well, uh, first of all, I wanted to say I did a workshop in, at Bath Library with Gail and um, oh. how nice that was. So you can't see me, so you won't remember who I am. Um, so that's quite strange. Um, as with the children's journey, I really liked the connection of a route and found I was often flipping back. Um, it wasn't so easy with this one to decipher it, but I thought it had such a beautiful organic shape and mystery to it, and it felt more like a treasure map. 
and I really like that. And um, when Andrew um, talked earlier about the rhythm of the journey, and I was thinking how there's quite a bit of toing and froing with it, and it, um, you know, with the chalk and the sea, but also it felt like the physical act of walking. And um, recently I walked along a very narrow overgrown path and had to kind of swish my hips and put my hands, arms above my head to try and avoid getting stung and grazed or tangled up. And, um, but the best thing about the book is that it so has made me want to get up and walk. And um, so I want to do, um, thank you very much for that. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you so much. And I recognise your voice. I'm sorry I can't see you, but I do recognise your voice. You, you probably asked a few questions or made a few comment, comments in Bath, but I do remember that. I'm sure I did. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. lovely to hear. And I tell you, when you know, when you when you write a book, you're not sure how it's going to be perceived, and you kind of hope it will be perceived as you meant it. But you you absolutely no guarantee that it will be. So when you hear people say the sort of thing you say and you think well that's kind of what you meant to happen that's quite that feels nice good <laughs> uh great thanks rosie um sheila uh are you there sheila would you like to ask your question pitch in i am yeah um i'm another of gail's students um but I, I, we've never talked i've never heard you talk about the book so it's really interesting i read this book in like over a weekend it was a very rainy weekend in dublin and it completely t took me somewhere else and i love when a book does that to you when you just completely get immersed you. in a different place and you can kind of feel everything about it wonderful two questions i've just got one there but there's two questions one is you mentioned walking alone is was lonely you know, you you talked about loneliness quite a bit, and I'm curious: is walking alone for you inherently lonely, or was it particularly so during the pandemic? And my second question is around the notion of secular pilgrimage. I mean, I got a sense that this wasn't necessarily a religious pilgrimage, and also that pilgrimages are now being redefined. So the idea of pilgrimage can be very much a journey into yourself as well as a physical journey, rather than necessarily being related to anything that is to do with um, institutional religion or you know, necessarily spiritual belief. So I'm just curious, they're my two things. I'm just curious, secular pil pilgrimages and loneliness when walking alone. Okay, well, I don't normally feel lonely walking alone. I'm, I mostly walk alone, but um, there were times where I was very aware of my aloneness and particularly there were, and you'll remember, I'll go into it in great detail for people who haven't read the book, there was a particular incident where, I mean, this was taking part in the background with the background of the Sarah Everard murder in London. I was walking about that time, one of the one of the walks I did. And there was a lot of talk about, you know, whether women should be going out on their own and you know it was unsafe and all this sort of thing. And it, it can't help but sort of seep into your consciousness. And there were times, you know, because you're walking, okay, it's the South Downs, it's not, you know, the Alps, but there are times when you are actually really alone. You don't see anyone for for hours. And I absolutely love that. I love I love the fact you can be in quite a crowded country and, and but feel completely alone but there are also times say let's say in the winter when it was rainy and muddy and I thought and I sort of walked past people's cottages and they were all sitting in having their lunch and I thought what am I doing here why am I putting myself through this why do I just why am I walking through the mud and the rain on a kind of February wet Sunday what am I doing you know but then then you push yourself on because that's what you have to do. What do you do? You turn back or you go on. And it's, to me, it's a kind of metaphor of for life. Do you turn back or do you go on? You can't just sort of stop. You know. So, so the loneliness part of the part of the um, the experience, the aloneness. Aloneness is good. Loneliness is not so good. I mean, I love the aloneness, but I don't really like the loneliness. And it's a little quite a narrow dividing line sometimes. And the pilgrimage bit, the British Pilgrimage Trust, who now sort of taken ownership of this walk. Their, their motto is bring your own beliefs because pilgrimage is, is yes it's a christian tradition but it's also a muslim tradition it's a japanese tradition it's a it's a natural thing to want to go and connect to somewhere that means something to you you get people going to graceland you know elvis elvis presley's house it's a pilgrimage you get people going to anfield because they like liverpool united you know so so it's a human need to connect with places that to make a journey to places that that matter to you for some reason and that to me is what a pilgrimage is 
It's been co-opted by the Christian Church because because that's they're very they were very good at that. They would co-opt a lot of the pagan sites. So if you find a holy spring, or you know, or if you find a medieval church, you'll often find a holy well near it. Why? Because the holy wells were 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 sort of celebrated, were very uh, venerated, if you like. And the Christian Church, Gregory the Great, said, "Well, look, if we want to make the pagans Christian, build churches, places of worship on top of." Places that people already worship. So you'll find them churched by yew trees, springs I've mentioned. So people have had this long, this long sort of deep need, long standing deep need to travel and to make, you know, often on foot to places that, that matter, sacred places, places that matter to them in some way. So yes, pilgrimage is, is I hope that answers your question. Um, great, uh, good, good uh, question, Sheila. Fantastic. Um, uh, Tamsin um, has a, uh, a question, some or a couple of questions in there, but um, about walking and, and um, tugging on your memories. So, Tamsin, tell us a, a little bit about your question. Uh, oh, you need to unmute. There you go. Hi, everybody. Hi, Gail. Can you hear me? Hi. Yep. Hi. Uh, yes, I, I I did the same as you. I walk, walked the first four days from Winchester to Guildford, uh, just in the July after the first after we first had COVID, because I was down. I'd got locked down with my mother in Kent, where I was born. Um, so I did those first four days and really struggled with the accommodation. So my first question was, you mentioned about how hard that was. How, how did you manage? Where did you stay? That was my first right. sort of practical question. Uh, okay, my well, second I can answer that. Yeah. Well, Sorry, that yeah, first, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank God for Premier Inns. Because, <laughs> yes, I had all these visions of staying in church churches because you can, you know, some of the churches were open for people, to, pilgrims to stay. Um, I, I wanted to go and stay in convents. So quite a few, there were a couple of convents on the route where, you know, we could go and stay with the nuns. However, in COVID, you know, the convents, they were sheltering their elderly nuns because they were mostly elderly. They, and I'm talking particularly about the first, you know, the first year or so. Um, churches, they didn't want to accommodate people. They didn't want to, a lot of them were closed, actually. And the only uh, Airbnbs people hadn't really opened up. I'm thinking particularly sort of summer 2020, summer and autumn 2020, when you were supposed to be in bubbles and all that sort of thing. Um, and the only places that were open often were these hotels like Premier Inns because they housed essential workers, people like, BT workers or road workers or electricians having to do essential work. So I um I stayed in those. I I people did ask, are you here for work? And I did say yes, because I was. Um, in my my view. But actually I thought to myself, this is this is great because I'm staying with all the people from all the different stratas of society. And that's how people would have again experienced pilgrimage in the Middle Ages. You know, you would have stayed, you would have really mixed. So if you look at the Canterbury Tales and you think of the people, the, the, the characters in the Canterbury Tales, they're all different walks of life or rides of life, you know, walks of life. So pilgrimage was the one activity that you could really mix with people from different walks of life. And so for me, I felt I somehow felt it was right that I was not staying in some sort of Airbnb where I'd be on my own, that I was mixing. You couldn't mix, you know, you had to have takeaway dinners and all that sort of thing. So it kind of felt right. It felt like the, the medieval hostel, actually. People would stay in hostels. People didn't have much money would stay in, in well, in hospitals, they called them, because from the, the hospitality. So the abbeys would often provide ho hospitality of hostels for pilgrims, and that's where they'd stay. So I kind of felt there was something, again, it resonated with the Middle Ages, even though it was inconvenient at the time and made traveling arrangements quite difficult to organize. In the end, it actually was better for the book and for my experience. That was your first question. And what was your second one? Thank you. Yes, that's very really interesting. Um, my second one was that um, I walked it partly because I've written a book about secular pilgrimage, which I'm trying to find a publisher for, and I've quoted extensively from the country of Larks because I was, <laughs> found that very inspirational. So thank okay. you. Um, uh, but and yes, you mentioned again earlier, little little. Uh, bit about your brother playing with your brother on the chalk soil 
the reason why I wanted to walk the Pilgrim's Way is because it runs through exactly where I was born and lots of my relatives live along it. So I'm hoping when I eventually finish it that I'll be able to stay with them. Did it bring up memories from the past for you? Did it? Did, did Absolutely images did. and yeah. It did because particularly as a lot of the villages were quite similar to the one I grew up in. So a lot of deja vu actually, you know, um, which was nice. Yeah, it was nice because. Yeah, it was. It certainly did, and I think that's partly partly why I wanted why why I wanted to walk it. But I, I like the sort of familiarity, but difference of walking on the South Downs as opposed to. I mean, it's a different landscape, but it had that familiarity. So so yes, um, it did bring back memories because you know where when you form such strong impressions when you're growing up, and I think they you know it felt it felt very familiar, even though it was a different land. I hadn't walked on that landscape before. It felt very it felt very familiar. I almost could. You know, I almost knew what was coming around the next corner. So how, how did you choose what to put in the book from from your own background and and? Oh, well, you, I tried to put you, in. How did you find that level? Uh, it's 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 quite difficult actually. The, the the publisher wanted me to put in as much memoir as possible, even though sometimes it felt like. I mean, it was fine putting it in, but, you know, there was certainly not from my publisher, but certainly when the book was going out, the agent was sending it out. There were some publishers were saying, well, where's, you know, we'd like a bit more trauma in here. You know, we'd like a recovering alcoholic or something. And, and I just wasn't. And, it, and, you know, and I thought it was a little bit, a little bit sexist because no one asked Robert McFarlane, you know, to put a lot of put trauma in his book because the writing holds up. And I don't I just wonder if it's because they ask women this more. You know, because there's been a lot of books like Rain or Winds or um, Amy Liptrotz or H is for Hawk, you know, um, uh, what's her name, McDonald, Helen MacDonald, where the whole thesis has been, the whole raison d'etre has been a kind of recovery. And I think there's this kind of genre of, of people recovering and making journeys. And, and I just wasn't, that wasn't what, what it was about for me. You know, so, so, that, so, um, so there were certain publishers that sort of said, well, we, we would like more trauma. <laughs> And I said, well, there isn't any. I mean, there is. Everyone's got some trauma, but that, you know, the, it wasn't a the theme of the book. But obviously, you know, and the editor said to me, bring in memoir because you, what you want is you want the reader to to. And I tell this to my students as well. You want the reader to to be with you on the journey. If they don't know the narrator, if they don't empathise with the narrator, then they're not going to come on the journey with you. You know, it's a journey of four weeks and how many pages it is, three hundred and whatever that pages. You know, it's a lot of it's a lot a big ask for people to come with you on that journey if they don't have, know who you are. Um, great, uh, good stuff. Thanks, Tamsin, and nice to see you uh, uh, on the, uh, on video. I um, saw Tamsin only a couple of weeks ago in Greece, so nice to see you <laughs> again. Thank um, you. Thanks. Uh, Gail Simon has um, picked up on uh, the. Uh, um, the 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 flimsy the flimsy qualifications that you can get from uh, uh, white brick universities for uh, a large amount of money. Um, but uh, he does ask a question. A good a good point, Simon. If you finish your supper and can ask it yourself, you can. Good. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so I've, I've observed that creative writing qualifications draw lots of really strong opinions these days, and even I had Will Self lay into this. Uh, I think it's taught that he actually administrates um, at a literature fair. And, and so, uh, as someone who every year I think puts in about 10 MAs they'd like to do, um, I've heard people say that, oh, well, what, what's the point of this craft? And it just can't replace the doing it. It's the doing that achieves it. But obviously, I presume you disagree in that you found there's a lot to be gained from external oversight and external insight and I wanted to say something about what you get um, when so much of it, I mean ultimately you do have to do the work don't you, but what is it you get from a creative writing system, qualification? Um, sorry, you're, you're slightly distorted, I think I got what you what you were asking, you, you asked what, what, what do you get from a creative writing qualification, nothing really from the qualification itself, we get an MA. I teach on an MA in travel and nature writing, but you get a lot from a year or two of 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 
guidance in perfecting your craft as a writer um, and and permission to write. Now, I've got two of my students here on this uh, talk, Amelia and Sheila, and um, maybe they would like to answer because they're coming to the end of their two years. What do you get out, Amelia and Sheila? What do you feel you get anything out of your two years of studying? Because you're, you know, you're the students, not me. Yeah, I'd love to answer that, uh, Simon. Basically, for me, what it has been was an opportunity. It's something that I've waited about 40 years to do and I wasn't able to write. And I mean, I've, I've written loads and I've, you know, I've done stuff over the years. But what it actually what the course has given me over the last two years is a guided series of exercises and then feedback on those exercises, which has taken me through everything from journalism to creative writing to writing short form to writing long form. And I suppose for me, it gave it a, a focus that, you know, deadlines, I'm really good on deadlines. So, you know, when somebody says you have to have it done, that suits me. And we're now putting together, I've got to put together 25,000 words for September on a whole variety of different styles. So from my point of view, I feel actually equipped to go um, out into the world, being able to write in a number of different styles. And I suppose I was coming from a position where I had never done any of this kind of writing. So that's what it's given me. I, I wouldn't say to it for everybody, it's nothing to do with the masters. It's actually to do with the, the support that I got in a learning environment to learn how to write and the different styles of writing. So that, that would be my thing. I don't know about Amelia, but like I, I, it's not for everybody, but it's certainly for me, it has been extraordinary in, in terms of learning. That's- Thank you, Sheila. Mm -hmm. But you know, you, you're right, it's, um you people people who don't who aren't writers think there is some kind of magic thing that you are not a writer and suddenly you're a writer but actually it's a process you know we're all writers if you want to write you're a writer but you know there's always room for improvement in your writing and giving someone two years to improve their writing to to to, to, to be allowed to perfect their not perfect but you know because we're always perfecting our craft but honing your craft without feeling that you're you should be doing something else or feeling guilty is a really important thing because you're you know you are it's like you know you, you're you, it's like a wine maturing you, you can't force it. it has to has to happen sort of slowly and with practice you know if someone someone can learn to play the violin but that doesn't make them a great violinist what makes them a great violinist is is, is hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of practice so what makes a good writer is hours and hours and hours and hours of practice everyone can put words on a page but it's those hours and hours and hours of practice and honing the craft and learning and you know, making mistakes and learning from them that make you, uh, make you, you know, improve you as a writer. So the qualification is just a qualification. That's all it is. And it only matters if you want to go on and do another qualification. Does that answer your question? Well, well done, Gail. Um, uh, just in case we hadn't noticed, Bob Parks has, would like to ask a question. I'm going to tell him, Bob, you are going to be the last question before the multiple choice quiz. So um, off you go, Bob. I'm having problems with um, um, chat. I can't get my word on. I've written it. Oh, here we go. I live in the New Forest. Do you know if it's illegal for planes to overfly national parks? It's almost a continual drone, which uh, destroys the voice of nature. Uh, how much is sound central to your motivation to go walking? To me, it's my intention. How much is sound important to going walking? You mean um, the sound of the of nature around you, birds and that kind of thing? That's the one we can't hear because planes are continually overflying. The that's really annoying, the isn't forest. it? I, I I don't know about the law about um, planes over the New Forest. I cannot answer that one. Um, There's no way that you can get away from the drone of planes. It's it's, it's awful. Yeah. No one seems to notice it. I notice it when I go back to the Chilterns, it must be said. I notice the planes. I don't notice them where I live. We have very few planes where I live now. Um, but yes, it's, 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 and I, you kind of feel sorry for all the animals and the birds who are having to put up with all this horrible noise when, you know, instead of sound of other birds. But yes, I find um, I'm quite affected by noise. And, um, you know, it's quite hard what to escape the sound of cars as well. Nature? 
What about the sound of nature? Yeah, yeah, sounds of nature. Yeah, important, important. Uh, you know, you often feel if you're walking and you hear the birds singing that they're kind of encouraging you on. I know that's just a quite an anthropomorphic way of seeing it, but you do feel that the sound of nature, certainly, you know, or a stream running or whatever it is, it's it's part. It's not just what you see, what you hear that makes you feel connected to the landscape. The last call is for you, Gail, as we wrap up. Uh, you get yeah. the last word. Thank you. A right. big, big thank you uh, for entertaining us for an hour. And uh, also to your publishers, um, Headline, for um, chipping in a couple of e-books. Um, but you have the last word, Gail. Well, I just want to say thank you for thank you for those people that read my book. And thank you for those people who've come here tonight. And some And some of you have done both. You've read my book and come here tonight. So thank you very much. Brilliant. Okay, well, uh, we wish everyone else a, a happy summer. And Gail, we hope your a book goes rapidly into reprint. We have a suspicion. Apparently, it has. Oh, you told me it has. Yeah, so you we told have me. a suspicion. I have no idea. 